Science has confirmed it. The open office is a nightmare. This is the focus group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's the focus group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Welcome to The Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Tim Bennett. Find us on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 p.m. East here on Facebook Live or YouTube. And of course, everything's at focusgroupradio.com, the on-demand site. So you can time shift to your heart's desire. And check out TFG Unbuttoned, which is our Tuesday podcast, available on Tuesdays. And of course, at focusgroupradio.com. Big uh, big thank you to our um, sponsors, Deep Discount being one of them. Uh, check out Deep Discount by going to focusgroupradio.com and clicking on the shark logo. Arr, we haven't heard him in a while. <laughs> so welcome to the week, Tim. Welcome, John. I have a quick question for you. I've, I've been seeing on these internets that um, these sites you can sell a used bicycle. Do you know anything about these where you can sell a bike? They're going to give you money for it? Well, you know, the, the issue with... You know, since the the event hit, um, all the supply chains for bicycles have been extremely disrupted and sales are really high. So this doesn't surprise me, but um, I haven't seen anything on it. Um, But I would be very cautious about buying a used bicycle sight unseen. Why are you thinking of getting one? Well, no, I wanted So I had this, you know, I had um, from back in the day, I had one of those Gary Fisher actual Ah. team. I yes. had one of those team team bikes from Gary Fisher. I think one you of the had a Sugar Three, maybe was it? Gary? Sugar. Yeah, sugar. that those are actually worth money. money. So you and it's a carbon frame, and if it's in good shape, I think you should try to sell it. Yeah, but I don't know how to go about it. That's why I didn't know whether you thought this was legit or not. I just didn't want to send it. Somebody offered me stupidly. It's like when I was offered. Marianne and I went to go to the Super Bowl when I lived in Minneapolis, and we were offered. $500 for the Super Bowl tickets. It was the Giants versus Buffalo, hmm. I think was the, was the thing. And I, we had, neither of us had ever been to the Super Bowl. After we were there for five minutes and gone in, we said we should have sold the tickets. I, <laughs> but we wanted to say we had gone to the Super Bowl. But, yeah. Well, you could have so gone outside, was, right? Right. Well, this is the same sort of thing. So I'm thinking, you know, somebody had offered me when I first got this bike. Somebody had seen me. I was down in Philadelphia riding it on the Wissahickon when I could still see. And uh, on the trails, and they said, "Oh my gosh, that bike, blah blah blah." Some guy offered me on the spot forty five hundred dollars for the bike, mm-hmm. and uh, and and I paid, you know, obviously less than that. But uh, I should have taken the forty five hundred bucks. When I think of it now, yeah, that's. I think that bike is a triple suspension off road, uh, like it's for going on wooded paths and gravel and dirt, right? Yeah, it's a real, it's a real yeah, team bike. I, I don't, it's way too much bike for me now here down in Rehoboth. I mean, you know, going the little gravel and go over the little planks to go, tit, 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 you know, over to, well, you know, you know I, I'll do a little R and D for you and I'll see what people, uh, I'll actually let Adam know about that. My friend Adam, because he's f- a fan of buying or listing used equipment and he gets great deals and you can find, and, and people will pay good money for the one you have because it's an addition um, he's not making the, I don't know if, if Gary Fisher himself sold that business to Trek or I forget who the main corporation is. But yeah, I think you're right. I think Trek took it. You know, that's a good point. Your friend Adam probably would be the person to yeah. ask. And if he knows somebody that might want it, I'd be happy to sell it. I don't, you know, I'm not looking to make a killing, but I also don't want to get ripped off. So if it is one of these pedigree bikes and somebody wants to buy it and it's worth something, I'd be happy to do it. And then I'll pick up a Schwinn. <laughs> that's such an interesting Compromise. Well, it's such an interesting substitution, Gary Fisher, full go suspension. Get ice cream. Get a Schwinn. So I think I might have mentioned to you earlier in the week that we had this dishwasher kerfuffle upstate. Um, you know, the the five year old dishwasher that was replacing the fifteen year old dishwasher just died. They don't make things like they used to, and I'm sure everybody listening right now is five not years old. Go- How old was the dish? Who made the dishwasher five years old? Samsung. And here's Korean? the thing. Yeah, well, you know, who knows where it's put together. Listen, somebody told you not to. Who told you not to? I think was it your brother-in-law? Somebody told you not to buy the Korean dishwasher. Uh, someone did, and it might have been my brother-in-law. Um, and, and sales reps will tell you the same thing, because if you buy, like, Whirlpool, uh, Maytag, Frigidaire, KitchenAid, I think you can get those serviced pretty well in the U.S. So we, we bought the dishwasher. Now we got it from Lowe's. And we ordered home installation, which is a separate thing that they do. Um, the installation company 
it was very laissez-faire. Maybe we'll come today. Maybe we'll come on the 22nd. You know, we eventually canceled that, picked it up ourselves, read the instructions. It's two hoses and a plug. Less, you mean lazy bear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Loud, trying to be French. Lazy. Yeah. They were lazy. It was very lazy. We hook it all up. We pull the old one out. We clean the space under the counter. Bob does some rewiring, which is terrific. Um, we slide the new one in. We get it all set up. It starts running. It runs for a while, and then it beeps. These air codes pop up. So wait, I, wait, 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 wait. Wasn't Lowe's supposed to install it? No, we canceled that part of it. We picked it up ourselves, and we just... Uh, okay. Because, again, it's it's the water connection, a drain connection, and an electric connection. It's three things. Okay. Air codes pop up. I go to the manual. There's this thing where you can do a diagnostic you push a series of buttons and the machine goes through and it keeps airing out on the draining thing so we pull it out we check the drain thing not a drop of water is in that pipe that comes out so we think something's wrong we do this again and again bob disappears i'm I'm scratching my head you know me i get like a like a raccoon in a can if if there's food inside i want to solve the problem so i'm like what's this what's this what's this finally bob comes in the kitchen he's like just stop I called Maytag. It's a year, a year manufacturer's warranty. They're coming on Friday. Let them fix it. And I said, do you think the machine's defective? And I, we couldn't believe it's brand new. But I, So I tell the story to my mom last night. And uh, without even missing a beat, my mom goes, you know, honey, I'm going to tell you something. She goes, you guys are not stupid. I think that machine's defective. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Now, do you, do you have a dishwasher in Manhattan? Yes, we do. Yeah. Do you, do you, I, I'm, did you have one before when you mm-hmm. lived in your other yep. farm? Yep. Well, we hate so it. We're, we're dishwasher folks. We like dishwashers. Yeah. See, I'm kind of shocked by that. I would have thought you would have been a non dishwasher family. Mm, no, we, we, we're really good about it. We load it up as full as it can be. We run it, um, you know, and I haven't mind washing the dishes upstate. We don't have a lot of them, but, uh, I prefer the dishwasher to be honest with you. So, uh, and it's there. Right. I mean, right. the how the here's the thing, though. The original one that we got with the house was a Kenmore. That thing was like a tank. I yeah, was, those Sears products were great. I was. Kenmore. Yeah. I was so sad when it died. You know, it just it died and it was like 18 years old. And it, it, this brings me back to something else. When we were kids, did your rotary phone ever break? Did your princess phone ever? The, I don't remember the phones breaking. I don't remember things breaking like this. Do you? No, you you rarely got anything new. The only time you got something new was if you got, you know, the big deal for us was going from black and white TV to a color TV. I think yours was given to you, right? Yeah, I think we got one. That's the only time I knew the Flintstones were. In Same color. here. We, my grandmother yeah. willed us her television when she went into the unfortunately a nursing home. We got the color TV and we turned it on. We're like, wow, Star Trek is really bright and the Flintstones and the Jetsons. But you're right. And then in a lot of cases, the refrigerator. If you had one of those old refrigerators with the one door and then it had the freezer inside uh-huh, that you opened, exactly that went into that went into the garage and it's probably still working <laughs> in some cousin's house holding beers, right? It's holding beers and sodas mm-hmm. for the picnics. For the so, picnics so the, the question winter. really is if they can do that with an appliance back in, in the 70s why can't they do it today but here's the thing if you mention it to, so if you say any like when we picked up the dishwasher some guy brought it up in a push cart from the stock room and i said uh this is replacing one that's five years old that's replacing one that was 18 and he just kind of smirks he goes so you know the story right and i said the story is it's disposable and you know who told you that to tell me wasn't that brian roman who brought it up from admark 360 who said you know yeah. Don't even waste your time. They're not, they're not, they're just not going to last. Yeah. Well, he's been through three dishwashers. You know, we, when he lived next door to me, I bought a, a Bosch dishwasher mm-hmm. when I, now it, I, it, so when I sold my house, it was 21 years old and it was still working. And, uh, wow. so it was great. My dad told me to get a Bosch. And so that's what I had bought. It was expensive, but it, it, I'd never replaced it. Brian, in the meantime, had replaced his dishwasher three times and his, and he bought, you know, cheapies along the way. <laughs> But uh, so I tried to buy the good stuff, but it, but I had replaced three refrigerators in that house, which um, that's right. I remember the refrigerator problems you had. OK, so you didn't have dishwasher, but it was refrigerator. OK, because I bought cheap refrigerators. Now I had there was a Sears refrigerator in there initially, Ken which Moore. like you, Kenmore, which yeah. was great. And my parents always had I grew Kenmore. up as mm-hmm. we probably all did. My parents said Kenmore washers and dryers, and my Craftsman I guess my tools. mom gave my brother the Kenmore washer, and it is still working. It's probably forty years old, and my brother still uses it up at his house in Connecticut. Yeah, that stuff. Well, you know, it's all planned obsolescence. It's like cars. Now, well, right? you know, and, and that's something that's uh, I pop up a lot. Like, there's this I see keep seeing headlines about the right to repair. Like, you know, the former 
co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak, is pushing this thing about the right to repair, the ability to actually open a computer up and change a part or to change a battery in a phone, right? Instead, they're so integrated that you toss the whole device. Um, so that, anyway, that, so that was my, uh, yeah. My, my. Well, you have to try to, as we know from a couple months ago, it's hard to get rid of a device. Next time, <laughs> it's just going out the window. That's when you were moving and you had to get rid of that old iMac. We have an iMac we have to get rid of too. And we just... Don't try. Half a day. Unless you call Apple. All right. All right. So they, <laughs> I, I, I accept. All right. So moving along here. Oh, oh! before I forget, and I should have done this at the start, um, we're going to be doing some Caught Our Eye. And in the second half of the show, we have a business birthday, and we do have two shop talks, one of which I teased at the start, where science is confirming that the open office plan is uh, hazardous to your health. Tim and I are not fans of the open office plan, so that's not a surprising topic. <laughs> so know, it's ridiculous. But here we go. What caught your eye? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. This is an ongoing topic, particularly with uh, with gay men. I think. So let, I'll just ask this one particular question: Did you did you ever? And before you and I started, I always hated. Ever since I was a little kid, I suppose, and, and you would listen to yourself on a tape recorder, or you would hear yourself in school when they would play back things. Maybe I always hated my voice. I don't know if you ever mm-hmm. did. You ever like your voice or hate your voice? Or- no, and it's common for people to not like how they sound recorded. But if you listen to yourself long enough. You get used to it, and um, I'm 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 happy with my voice. But I think so you're okay now. I think when you when you reference high school or something, or maybe even college, I'm not so sure. Like I heard an audio recording of myself from high school, and I was like, ugh. <laughs> so let's. Uh... So this so this was a story about, and it, it was more of a commentary. It came out of the Advocate, and it was about a guy who said, "I had to degay my voice for work," and then he said, "I'm not alone." And so this was a commentary about a guy who was in he's in a relationship. He's married. Uh, to another another man, and he talked about how there were so many strides um, in the gay community, or in particular the LGBT community. He talks about marriage and how he and his husband have a family, and all the and he had uh, advanced degrees, but he was not able to land a job, and he couldn't figure it out. He had all this, um, you know, all the pedigree and everything, and he thought he had this perfect life, and he said he couldn't find a job. And eventually, after he had graduated from Vanderbilt Law School. He um, was interviewing with a bunch of different law firms around the Nashville area, and he said he would get plenty of interviews. And then after he would have the interview in in person, um, he would never get a call back and never get the job. And finally, he said it, there was one woman who set him down and, and could, because he said, I can't figure out why I'm not getting a job. And this woman looked at him and said, I think it's your voice. Wow. <laughs> was it a close friend or was it some like? Uh, it was a, it was a career placement okay, officer at okay. the school, and she she looked at him and she said, um, and so she set him up with a voice coach, and because she said, I think you sound a little bit like a ten year old girl from Mississippi. Oh my God, that's so which which that's I devastating. immediately thought of who was who was the little guy that used to play? Um, um, God, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. Famous guy was on a bunch of shows from the South. Leslie Jordan. Yes, that's exactly. Thank you. He John, used to be the foil today. for Karen on Will and Grace, right? Karen. Right, and on a bunch of other shows, <laughs> yeah. very popular. And as the but so when Funny, they said you yeah. sound like a ten-year-old girl from Mississippi, I, I thought of that. And so he goes to this voice coach, and the voice coach also then told him he needed to watch his hand gestures. He needed to keep his hands down when he talked. He was he. They said he was also very. He was always uh, too expressive with his hands. And so there's this voice coach said. Be, as he would still talk and as he became more animated and excited, they kept saying, put your hands in your lap, put your hands in your lap, and then would yell at him, don't be so gay. He ends up, <laughs> oh um, my God. he ends up taking all this advice and then starts interviewing again and lo and behold, lands a job. Mm. And so, so it reinforces talks, the advice, I suppose. Right. And so then he talks about how he says, um, although he doesn't want to admit it and how there's been all these strides about, um, about acceptance that there really was this prejudice about his voice and about how he sounded and he thinks it's sad and that people should be who they are and they should be judged about who they are and shouldn't have to change the way they are and the way they sound. But the reality was it's the only way he got a job and thought that it's the next, it's the next level of respect and the next level of how we have to move forward. And so then I went through and looked at a bunch of other stories that have been written, the New Yorker, Wall Street Journal, They've all done a bunch of these stories about what they call gay voice, I guess. 
And they talk about how it's a real thing and people know it and, and um, some people can hide it. A lot of people try to hide it if they can. Some people just can't hide it or they don't care to. But they said that there really is a decision that people make. And you have talked about this many times about managing your identity and managing your brand as you're growing up, depending upon what you want to do. If you were, for instance, somebody wanted to play sports and you were very good at sports and you got teased or bullied a lot and you maybe you would try to change your persona or you would try to you know, maneuver your way around so you wouldn't get wouldn't get bullied or try to fit in with with the crowd you wanted to be in. And so that's that's kind of where he was going with this thing. But I, I wondered about it because I know a number of other shows, even when we run out, you used to talk about this gay voice thing and whether people like their voice and how they would change it or how they would maneuver it. And so I, I felt um, I think we've all gone through that uh, time where we don't particularly care for our voice or you try to be more masculine or you try to fit in more. And um, this was again, this guy said this was, you know, proof positive that. I had to get a voice coach in order to get myself a job. Amazing. So, you, you, do you do you happen to remember, and, or did you see a documentary that uh, it might be still on Netflix or it might be on Amazon Prime? It's called "Do I Sound Gay." It's from 2014, and it's this documentary about this exact topic. So, I, I think that this is fascinating. And what I think is more interesting in, in what you pointed out in the story is that he succeeded in the interview right. section, in the interview situation by actually changing his voice, which sends an interesting message, doesn't it? I mean, but so yeah, um, do I sound gay is, is actually a, a documentary about that exact thing and it's really well done. So I think it's prime or Netflix, but that one would be worth watching because it tackles exactly what you're talking about. And well, it goes, it goes, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say it also affects people who aren't gay. You know, there, there are right. several men that just have certain voices and they're perceived to be a certain way, right? Right. They could have a high pitched voice. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, it also goes, it's, it's people's inherent bias. It's the same thing with many people talk about with names. If you have a very ethnic name or an ethnic sounding name, yep. it's the same sort of thing. People will have an inherent bias. They'll say they don't, but, but they, they do. might look at a name and immediately make a assumption of who you are or the type of person you are and they just move on and versus just a very blind resume. Mm-hmm. So... So it is a, it's a real it thing. Is an inter- yeah, it's a re- it is a real thing. And I think uh, and that's what he was trying to say. Will we get to a point where that's not going to be a real thing? I'm maybe not in my lifetime. I don't know. Although things seem to be changing fast, but <laughs> not the way we think, but they're changing. <laughs> yeah. So what caught your eye? Oh, uh, mine is a I thought this was more of a Tim Bennett thing. Actually, uh, headline is. There's an actual reason why hot dogs and buns don't come in equal count packaging. Okay, so, I've, I've wondered this forever. So this is why I said this was a total you thing. So let's say a package of hot dogs is 10, and when you buy buns, you're getting like 6, right? Or 8, but you're not getting eight. 10. Yeah, you're getting... So there's a reason for this. Um, it turns out that the National Hot Dog Sausage Council, that's a real thing, um, they claim, uh, which this council was claimed uh, formed in 1994, explained the mismatch packaging is simply because of the way things were sold back in the day. <laughs> so I love the way they just punt on that one. Back in the day. It wasn't until 1940 that we actually began seeing hot dogs packaged in packs of 10, which is why you typically see in stores. So why are the you know buns in 10 or 8? Uh, why aren't buns in 10? Well, it says it's because it's the way they're baked. And this has not changed since the 40s, apparently. Sandwich rolls or hot dog buns most often come 8 to the pack because the buns are baked in clusters of 4 in pans designed to hold 8 rolls. Uh, while baking pans now come in configurations that allow baking 10 and even 12 at a time, the 8-roll pan remains the most popular. Uh, the increased talk about this issue um, has hatched a petition um, by the Heinz Ketchup Company of Canada to end the hot dog packaging mismatch. <laughs> At the time of this article, uh, Change.org had 7,500 signatures, or they had 5,500 of the 75 they were trying to get. And what they're trying to get is to have the bakers change their pans to the 10 as opposed to the 8. But it, it, this, the reason is beyond simple, and it's almost stupid when you think about it, right? Because the pans are doing 4, 4, four you know. <laughs> so there you go. That's why there's a niche. That's why we always said it. See, I always thought it was 2 for the dog, you know. So we'd get, you know, why do we do 10? We 2 for the dog. So it, it, 
so I guess that's a good point, right? So you would do, so you always have to buy two bags. Uh huh. But they do have a solution. If this chain, if the, if this continues with ten hot dogs and eight buns, just purchase five eight packs, five eight pack buns and four ten pack hot dogs, and enjoy your forty meals because they'll be a perfect match. <laughs> You gotta freeze them. They exactly. Need to, freeze them in the garage. to get it one to one, you gotta do crazy stuff. So I just a, threw a whole bunch of rolls away that were moldy. Did you really? Yeah, well, sadly. You know, I, I like the you Costco don't like, hot dogs. You, so you do you, not you, like You don't throwing, eat a hot dog, dude. Oh, I love the Costco hot dog. You turned us on to that. That's the only time I eat a hot dog, by the way, is when I go to Costco. Well, you know, you can buy the long ones. You can buy them. They sell them there. And then they also sell the same hot dog shorter. But you can buy the long ones that they sell there for a dollar fifty and the roll. Mm, all right. And in order to get the same flavor, though, you have to steam them, and you can steam them with some sauerkraut. And that's water. what does it. That's what does it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you do it. So mine was a very simple little summary caught our eye. I like that one. No, oh, thank I you. I think that was a good one. I don't know where you found it. Uh, Yahoo. Yahoo News. Lifestyle section. You got to poke around, right? Okay. Yeah. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got uh, business birthday and then some shop talk. So stay with us. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now back to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Hey, welcome back to the show. John Nash with Tim Bennett. It's the Focus Group. And on this half, we have a business birthday, the world famous business birthday, the only in the universe. We don't know of any other planet who's doing business birthdays right now. And if you are and you have a copyright, let us know. It's going to take a long time for that message to get to Earth. <laughs> billions at, and billions of years. of years. We won't even be here to you know, file a counterclaim. And then we have some shop talks for you. And before we went to break, we were talking about hot dogs and buns. And I actually said, and I just want to repeat this, that Tim, you are... You are probably the smartest person I know when it comes to food, and you do not like to waste food. Can't you tell? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not about eating. It's about you're very careful about what you buy and what you eat, and you do not like throwing things away. So having to throw away buns that were moldy, that probably was a, that probably stung a bit, right? Well, and yes, and I also had to throw away some chicken breasts that uh, people Uncooked? did not eat. So we had some guests over the 4th of July, and uh, I made a lot of chicken breasts that I thought would be consumed, and uh, they weren't, and I was upset that I had to throw some of those away. But uh, I, yeah, so um, Richard has no problem throwing food away. It Neither does Bob. That's why you and I are always comparing the two. Bob will just toss things on. Like, do you realize that? I said, go out to a tree and pick some money off. See if you can uh -huh. do it that easily. <laughs> Well, John, it's because you and I do the shopping. And yes. Drink and, 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 well, we'll just leave it there. <laughs> and on that note, we have a business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. This business birthday is for John Nash. So, <laughs> and it's actually, the birthday was yesterday, but I didn't want to let it go by. So it's... Uh, Gentleman was born July 13th. He celebrated uh, 70, his 77th birthday yesterday. He's a Hungarian inventor, architect, and professor of architecture. His name is Erno Rubik's, <laughs> inventor of the Rubik's Cube, and also Rubik's Magic and Rubik's Magic Snake. I didn't know these other toys, did you? The Cube's the most popular. I have heard of the other ones, but this is the Kingpin, and this is this has spawned competitions speed cubing you've heard of, you've seen all this stuff right like yeah they said so somebody can actually do this cube in under like 3.2 seconds is which is just crazy right now you used to can you still do it i tried you know we uh the picture i have up here um is of a uh, of three rubik's cubes unsolved in the middle of solved and then solved and this was a image we we're using on our company website tribrary.co by the way, that's a shameless plug for me and Tim. Check it out, tribrary.co. Our marketing history is there. And Tim loved the idea of this of puzzle solving. That's what we do. And um, But he's referencing the fact that in high school, I used to be able to do the cube pretty quickly. I 
I struggle. I, I'm going to have to get a cheat sheet to teach myself. I taught myself how to do it, but I can't do it anymore. So the answer is no, I can't do it anymore. Not in three seconds. Well, what was great about it is John, John used to, um, John, John was able to, are you still there, John? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. So for some reason, my phone is going off. Like, could you hear that? No, nope, not like at all. Crazy. Don't worry. <laughs> this technology, I'll tell you people. So John used to entertain people with doing the cube. And we were at a friend's, remember we were at a friend's uh, anniversary party and you remember, do it again, do it again. John was, we were in high school and John, they would mix the cube up and then John would do the cube. So I was always amazed and I wanted to, I think this year, I should have done it during the event, but this year I think I want to learn how to do the cube. So there's apparently a tutorial on YouTube. You can, you can many, do many, on, on many, how to solve yeah. it. So I, th I think we have to do that. But the um, so anyway, it's his birthday, 77 years old. He, his dad was um, his dad was an engineer. And he said that his dad really gave him what he said was a lot of the impetus to be curious and to really um, get involved with puzzle solving and working with algebra and math and numbers. And so he said that uh, his dad was an engineer, very respected in communist Hungary and uh, developed um, different types of gliders, air gliders and planes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but he was, he was more involved in our uh, Rubik's, uh, the son who did the, the cube was more involved in architecture and sculpture and arts and design in uh, Budapest. And uh, he made the first cube out of wooden blocks. Wow. And he, it was 27 wooden blocks that he carved himself and used elastic bands and used elastics to put it together. And this was in 1974. He applied for a patent and got it in 75. And it was a three-dimensional puzzle. It said it took him over a month to solve it. <laughs> and I can't, I can't even give the you The inventor took a month and kids can do it in three seconds. Okay. Right. And they said it was like 43. And then I think there's something like 17 numbers beyond it of how many different you know, combinations there are of it. But they said he started with these wooden blocks and so forth because that was the easiest thing they could find, of course, you know, with the communists, you know, workers' paradise. There wasn't a lot of plastic or things around. So um, he eventually, um, after, the, after the cube and worked with it and the kids kind of liked it and they saw that people were excited about it, he tried to get um, the, the state of Hungary uh, interested in it. And they said it proved to be a useful tool to teach algebra in 77 Consumex, which was a Hungarian state trading company, began to market it in 1977. But um, obviously, again, it wasn't going to be as popular as it could have been if the Westerners got a hold of it. So in 1980, he was able to, in 79, he sold the licensing rights to Ideal Toys, which we all know Ideals was a U.S. company. Mm -hmm. So by 1980, it was marketed throughout the world, and over 100 million units were sold. And then there were 50 million unauthorized imitations or knockoffs. Wow, that's a lot of knockoffs. <laughs> right, within, within yeah. three, well, you know, the communists. And then uh, they rebranded the cube. So it was initially called the Magic Cube. They rebranded it, Ideal rebranded in the 80s as the Rubik's Cube. And then it was, you know, given to an international audience. And uh, from there, it just took off. It was Toy of the Year. It was a staple of 1980s culture. To date, 350 million cubes have been sold. It's uh, one of the best-selling toys of all time, and uh, he had countless awards. And then he continued to make uh, all kinds of books. There's over 50 books published describing on how to solve the, the cube. And then um, he's, he's invented a bunch of other things, furniture, which I didn't know, and uh, other types of games. But as you said, John, he's really most known for the cube. But uh, there's some other sort of puzzles, but they never took off. And then there's lists, probably three pages long of lists globally of awards he's won and uh, in recognition he's, he's had. But what a great thing to invent and be known for. There, you know, as you were outlining the history of this, I thought to myself, someday they're in the far future, they're going to dig up like an old landfill and they're going to dig up cubes, <laughs> Rubik's Cube after Rubik, because of millions of these things, right? Really great documentary on Amazon. It might be called Gleaning the Cube. I might get that wrong, but um, it looked at two cube solvers because they have special speed cubes you can buy that move right. really quickly. Uh, and then there's the normal Rubik's one. But Tim, I heartily encourage you to go on Amazon, 
find a cube like a Rubik's cube. I got one for, I forget what it's like $8 or something. You can buy a book. I did download some of the tutorials and um, I did find them frustrating, by the way. There's a lot really? of, yeah, you know, um, there was like, you do this, turn right three times, turn left. It was like picking a lock, frankly. <laughs> see, I'm surprised because you're usually monkey see, monkey do. Once you figure it out, you, you don't forget things. So I'm surprised you don't remember it. Mm, this because goes... we, what you used to say, I remember you telling me, you said you have to get one color. You would, you would figure it out by getting one side done first. Yeah, that's you would actually. Say if you yeah. did, if you did blue or you did white or whatever, and then you could, was that true? Or mm-hmm. you used it's, to be able to click, 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 click. You were pretty good at it. It's still true, and there are there's a whole methodology for how you line up the thing. You get one face correct, one whole face is one color. Then right. you start doing the thing. Part of my muscle memory came back a little bit, but then I got frustrated one night. I just put the thing down. I thought, okay, I bought this to photograph it. I'm not going to torture myself. <laughs> but wow, you know, I'm you make me think that. that that I should pick one up again because. It is a. It's not a bad pastime. It, it it engages your mind. So, and that's better than watching the news lately. I'll tell you that. Well, he's an avid gardener, John, and he likes collecting succulents. Ah, okay. So he's got a whole like you know, cactus and the hens and chicks and all those little you know succulent garden. Okay. I, was like, I always thought that was an odd word. <laughs> He also has a special interest in science fiction. This guy's right up your alley. Succulents and science fiction. <laughs> Succulents and science fiction. Succul- wants- that's, that's not, so that could be a movie. Succulents and science fiction. Yeah, he wants to go to Mars. Okay. So as we mentioned uh, at the good business birthday, by the way, and thank you. So we each got something for each other. You got the hot dogs and the buns. I got the Rubik's Cube, which I'm very appreciative of. So um, we mentioned at the top of the show that uh, we have two quick shop talks for you. This one comes as no surprise to me um, when the headline says, Signs confirms that open offices are a nightmare. Now, at at first you think, hmm, I wonder what they're talking about. What they're actually getting at here is that the open office plan exposes people to a level of noise, um, constant noise, that actually has a cognitive and physiological performance effect. And it's obviously a stress and a mood inhibitor. So they did this study um, and they looked in experimentally, they controlled things like heating, uh, the heat, heart rate, skin conductivity, and they used AI to actually capture facial, facial emotions and use that as a recognition technique to show the effects of the noises on, on people in the real world and in these open spaces. Now, if you ever watch like landscapers, um, all, a lot of the guys that we see doing landscaping, they always have those earmuffs on. And I asked, I actually asked our neighbor one day, I said, are you listening to a radio? No, no, they're just... Their earmuffs. He goes, you can't be exposed to that kind of noise all day. It, it tires you out. I just thought, oh, interesting. So then this comes along, and basically they've shown that um, the results of their experiments that the op- open office leads to about a you know a negative a rise of negative mood of twenty five percent of the participants over the course of the study. And then they talk about how they simulated the open office and what they did and how they captured this. But what did you think of this article? Well, you and I have talked about this a number of different times. <laughs> we've nauseum, seen this. Yeah. Op- we've seen the open office in, in 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 the in the native or in the wild, and how horrible they work. Yeah. And why companies continue to do them, I don't know. One of our clients, we've mentioned several times, Volkswagen. We would go see somebody in the open floor plan. Well, nobody was ever there. That's why they were open. Everybody left because nobody could get ever anything done. They were outside. They were in their cars. They were in the cafeteria. They were everywhere but at their desk because it was too noisy. Right. Mm-hmm. We, so, it so was were, amazing. The, Tim Tim would laugh. Like we would go down to one of these corporate headquarters and, <clears throat> oh, we can't find who you're supposed to have a meeting with. Well, they were, as Tim just said, they were out in their car having a call because right. they can't do it in the open space. But this takes a slightly different tact in that it, it looks to it looks to validate this notion that distraction and noise actually leads to a rise in neg- a negative mood. They're not sure how much it in, impacts performance on a day-to-day basis but cumulatively this has a negative effect on on performance in the space so but the noise thing to me so this is what i did take away differently than all the other times i've read these studies yes so then i thought hmm why did they even do a study because we all know we all grew up in going to libraries which are open floor plans quiet and what do they always tell you to do in a library you have to be quiet you're not allowed to talk (laughs) and why is that because you can't get stuff done with noise around right because of the distraction Mm -hmm. because of the noise so they need to be quiet so 
I think the study's been done many, 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 many years ago, right? That li <laughs> their libraries are quiet for a reason, right? You know, this is why you're running for commissioner. And I'm sure you've been told by some of the people that you're doing your meet and greets with that you're a little too smart and maybe a little too frank. But you're right. If you just look at the library, we've had libraries for ever. For, and, and, and what did they show? If you're quiet, you get work done. And we had to do it, you know. If you How were many on times the you've been shushed in a library, we've all been shushed in a library. So if you were on the grant writing committee and this study came in front of you, you'd tap it. You, what is this? I'll yeah, tell you what. I'm you know what this study is? This. this is the public library. We can prove this already. You get it's more work. Study. <laughs> you get more work done in the library when it's quiet. Yeah. Well, nicely done. I think you've just you know, kibosh that. I mean, you didn't, you, what did you, you agreed do? to it. You used to go downtown. You used to yeah. go downtown to the library. You, you go to the, perform what, did you go to the performing Two. arts library? I went library? to the performing arts library or the reading hall of the main library at Bryant Park, which was beautiful and it was dead quiet. And that library on 42nd Street, the main library, um, they have tourists walking around and when they, they, they're not allowed in the reading room and the reading room is where everybody's working and there are students right. and, and you can hear a pin drop in there. That's yeah. how quiet it is. Yeah. And it's for that reason you would go there because it was quiet and you could get mm -hmm. work done. And it was just a different space to be in for a while. And especially the reading room at the New York Public Library, 42nd Street. It's gorgeous. If you have a chance to visit, if you're visiting, visiting the city, check it out. It's You'll want to take your laptop and work there, trust me. And it was an open floor plan. <laughs> yeah. So there was, was no need for a study. <laughs> Give me my money back. You just saved the town a bunch money of money. Wasted again. This is the stump speech, folks. This is what's happening. The election's coming up, and Bennett, Bennett for commissioner. I agree. And there should be no toll booths either. I've already paid taxes on the car. I paid tax on gas. I paid tax on the. Should be no toll booths. I mean, you know, you can go down the road. Mm -hmm. And that's a rabbit hole. Don't, lot tax, me, don't tax me on money I've been taxed on already. <laughs> And the other shop talk we have is a really brief one. It's just one of these things I think I, I like this story because it's what I call the unintended consequence. And what the unintended consequence is, um, you know, when when we start driving more, when we produce more things, we need more of a raw material. In this case, uh, the headline reads, what the impending rubber apocalypse means for the U.S. economy. So I don't think any of us really think about this too much, no. like where rubber comes from, but it's an essential part of a huge part of our industrial complex, right? I mean, all our tires, you know, there's gaskets, there's, rubber is everywhere, and yet it's a, it's a finite, you know, material, right? A raw material, and it's a global issue because we're not the only ones using it. So, um, yeah, it, it's it just basically the article is that there's going to be a very big crunch coming in terms of fulfilling the demand for rubber. <laughs> I just invest, thought, yeah. Invest in rubber. Yeah, you know and that, yeah. go ahead. No, they said, to, you know, they were, and I, I never thought of it. I guess it was similar to cork, right? When they, they've had to mm -hmm. do synthetic cork because cork is the same sort of issue. And they're blaming, or not blaming, but there's an issue with climate change yep. because a lot of the, the, the rubber that comes from Asia, particularly Thailand, is some of the rubber trees are being affected in the farmers and they're not be able to harvest as uh, climate change happens. And um, and with more cars being on the road, and that means more demand for tires and all the other rubber that goes into making an automobile, for instance. I, I guess you, you don't think about it. And mm -hmm. but then I thought, you know, with recycling, can you recycle? And then they were talking about synthetic. You know, can you make yeah. synthetic rubber? But it's not as good as, um, I guess, real rubber. Mm -hmm. And and you know, you bring up a great thing. So. You can recycle metal and you can recycle rubber, but what they will tell you is that once you form these materials into a shape and they're used, they lose some of their properties in the recycling right. thing. So recycled rubber is never going to be quite as strong or as, as uh, resilient as the uh, the raw material in its original form. And that's why, didn't you used to talk about this when you sold steel, Tim? Um, isn't there right. something about a pure part of the product and they were allowed to add something else. There was a name for what they could add into it. Um, it was like a, it's not an additive, but there was something about a post. It, am I getting that right? Or no, you're exactly right. You don't want to use recycled steel. You're building a plane for instance, yeah. or, you know, you don't want recycled rubber. I, I, the Chinese were making recycled rubber tires. I remember I bought a set <laughs> and the I dealer said, story. The, the dealer said to me, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, I want the cheapest tires you have because I got these Chinese Pelellis. I said, Pirelli's, he goes, no, they're Pirelli's. I said, oh, I said, I'll take those. You know, they were like $22 a tire. He goes, what are you doing with those? I said, I'm putting it on a car. He goes, 
whoa, 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 I won't let you drive with those. I said, I'm giving the car away. He goes, well, they're going to last about seven days. <laughs> That story always makes me laugh when I heard Pirelli's. that. Pirelli's. And I still remember yeah. the guy looking, oh, I got Pirelli's. I said, look again. And those are L's. Oh, Pirelli's, yeah. <laughs> Pirelli's. <laughs> so, but yeah, you don't want recycled. There's certain no. things you don't want recycled. So but, just to uh, put to put what Tim was talking about, the scope of this market into perspective, uh, 90% of the natural rubber in the world comes from Asia. The U.S. imports 140 million worth, um, and that was in March of 2021 alone. And they they believe that by 2026, we're looking at a 68.5 billion dollar industry. So, quick one for you: years and years ago, not well, uh, probably six or seven, maybe seven or eight years ago, uh, Bob's mom was sitting one day, and she was she was reading about all these online companies and how everything's being shipped. She calls her broker up and she decides to uh, buy the stock of a company that's one of the major one or two or three in the company in the country that makes cardboard boxes. <laughs> she made a killing on that. I mean, and that reminds me of my doorman years ago. I came home one day from from the library or from work or something and uh, Jarvis was sorting packages and there's a whole stack of diapers.com boxes. And I said, diapers.com. I said, boy, Jarvis diapers. He goes, Hey, and he was a a night supervisor at UPS as well. And he said, John, I gotta tell you something. If you got some extra cash, you want to go and put it in diapers.com. I said, how do you know? He goes, because I see the, the number of those boxes has increased tenfold over the past few months. I just kind of laughed and thought native wisdom, right? And so um, months later, diapers.com was bought by Amazon for, I think it was like $1.3 billion or $1.5 billion in cash and stock. And if you had owned the diapers.com stock, you would have been a beneficiary of that because they obviously had to buy your shares. And <laughs> so I just... Another, other thing we missed. But, you, but here's how we missed it. It was right in front of us. So here you have my, my guy Jarvis, right? who sees the boxes every day and starts registering the fact that there's a high volume of diapers. Di or Bob's mom, who says, hmm, everything's got to go from A to B in a box. I wonder who makes those. I think I'll invest in that company. That's how, yeah. Well, did you see the, did you watch the video that went with this story? Yes, I did. The woman with the making the dance, she was growing dandelions. So they're trying to grow rubber in the U.S. and she's doing it with dandelions. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. It was like a, a pinhead worth of that latex. Oh. I thought that's a lot of dandelions. <laughs> <laughs> there you go see it's once again you, you're not going to get what you get from those trees in asia with a bunch of dandelions yeah but no, i thought you well go. you know it's admirable however there you go yeah you got to grow cannabis that's what i would do if i had a million if i had a lot of money i would i would go i would donate money to a school to start studying cannabis that's what i would do you know it's an interesting proposition because you couldn't really uh study it being that it's federally still a regulated and illegal drug, right? So all the medical benefits, no, no one really knows because it's all anecdotal, little research here, but you're right. Uh, but on the cannabis side, you know, I just read an interesting article. Um, there are growers that literally burn or toss tons of their product because they can't move really? it fast enough to the dispensaries and you can't sell across state lines. So you have to grow it in the state you're selling it in. It would be so much different if they could grow it, package it, and ship it. <laughs> I think we're, we're going to see that someday soon, but you got to put it in drinks. Ah, next time. That's I, what we can do. Next time I come visit you, I'm going to bring you some, uh, cannabis infused seltzer. Oh, like, do you have that? Yeah. Gary turned me on to it. They sell it at a place in Massachusetts. It's a beverage and, um, they have different levels of infusion and he was the, he, he took the plunge and I said, how was What's it? He think? He, he liked it. He said it, it has a very pleasant, mild, uplifting feeling, and it wears off. And you, you don't even you're not even aware that it wore off, basically. But you are aware at the onset. You, you do feel a little bit, you know, up and a little giddy. But that was the lower percentage of infusion. I'm curious to see what the the higher number one. But I, test, I yeah. test. <laughs> I'll just send you a JPEG of what the packaging looks like, but. This uh, dispensary in Mass sells it, uh, Theory Wellness, I think, and um, legitimate product, right? But of course, it can only be sold in Massachusetts, and I wonder if it has to be bottled there as well because of the, you know, where they get the supply from. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's going to be the next horizon. They kept talking about that out in California about doing the uh, infused beverages. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, we'll see. See what happens. So, hey, everybody, thanks for joining us. It's uh, it's the Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Thanks to our sponsors as well. Head over to focusgroupradio.com and click on our sponsors over there and support them. 
uh, because they support us and we appreciate uh, them supporting us to bring us to you each week or bring us to you each week. I guess that's what it is. And um, be sure to find all of our media there as well and our past shows. You can watch our video broadcasts as well as our podcast, which is TFG Unbuttoned, which is released on Tuesdays. We hope you're all staying cool. <clears throat> Excuse me. We hope you're all staying cool in this hot summer. And we'll see you next week. Take care. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.